Hello, welcome to our CompTIA Security Plus course. In this lesson, we're going to talk about incident mitigation, covering containment and eradication, quarantining, configuration changes, application control, and SOAR. Incident mitigation requires containment and eradication of the threat. Containment usually isn't long-term solution. Where initial configuration errors exist, eradication may simply involve fixing those errors. On the other hand, eradication may also be short-term. The primary purpose of incident response is to reduce or prevent further damage from an incident. This usually involves reducing the attacker's access. While not always ideal, the most immediate way to stop an incident that is still in progress is to shut down the affected systems. Shutting down systems impacts operation and so isn't usually a viable solution, right? And it may not be even feasible because of the impact. It's important to find a balance between shutting things down completely and letting the attack run rampant. This balancing act usually has operational repercussions, but shutting down systems is usually a short-term means to stop the bleeding until longer-term solutions and remediation strategies can be put in place. It is usually more appropriate and often necessary to make immediate changes to security systems such as implementing firewall, router, and endpoint configuration systems. There are a number of ways an incident can be mitigated, which includes the following. So these are blocking unauthorized access, quarantining, cleaning, and removing malware, blocking unauthorized access, blocking sources such as email websites and IP addresses, approving source IP addresses and services that should be allowed, blocking ports, services, and application, modifying DLP or data loss prevention scanning to look at outbound files for larger data sizes, redirecting URLs, and isolating workstations and network systems. Now let's talk about quarantining, right? Anti-malware endpoint solutions should be applied on endpoints, including servers. Ideally, if a machine becomes infected, it should be isolated from the rest of the machines by being removed from the network. Most anti-malware solutions used today are fairly effective. Even so, new malware types of zero-day threats may get through. In addition, users might disable security software if they're able to do so because it interferes with programs that are currently installed on the machines. As a result, it may be necessary to isolate a system and ensure that the machine is scanned. An important function provided by anti-malware solution is the ability to quarantine infected files. Quarantining a file does not delete it or clean it. Rather, quarantining involves moving a file to a managed and safe location so that it does not affect anyone else or spread. Malware usually seeks to exploit a vulnerability. This means that there are three basic types of systems during such an incident. The first one is an infected system. It could be a patched system. It could be an unpatched system. When areas infected systems should be isolated and, you know, um, and malicious files quarantined, unpatched systems should be attended to in parallel, right? You essentially need to inoculate them against the malware by ensuring that endpoint security solutions are updated and patching the systems if a patch is available. Now let's talk about configuration changes. When systems can't be shut down, the impact of an attack can often be mitigated through temporary configuration changes. In addition to firewall and application configuration changes, which are discussed shortly, the following changes can mitigate uh, an incident. First is content filtering or URL filtering. Content filtering is particularly useful for limiting email and web content from known sources. During an attack, filters may need to be adjusted to limit further damage. For example, emails with certain known characteristics can be blocked based on the subject, the sender, the body, or the attachment. Second is certificate revocation. 
Certificates ensure trusted secure communication between clients and servers. However, to mitigate an attack in which the attacker has a trusted certificate or an upstream trusted authority has been compromised, revocation of the certificate or trust may be needed. Third is uh, DLP, right, or data loss prevention. DLP rules can be adjusted to prevent data from being exfiltrated. There are domains regardless of their physical attachment of the network. Also talk about firewalls. So firewalls act as gatekeepers for hosts and networks. Firewalls are not implemented to completely isolate computers and networks while they do block access, allowing proper access is a key function. As a result, firewalls provide a point of entry. During an incident, modifying the rules on a firewall can have a huge impact on ensuring that damage is mitigated. Firewalls can be configured to block, for example, certain locations or ports. They can also be very specific, such as blocking access from a particular host. Configuration changes on a firewall can be particularly helpful in mitigating several types of attacks, such as phishing attacks, session hijacking, and exposed hosts. General good practices should be allowed on the initial configuration of a firewall rule set. However, mitigating an incident may require more precision or loosening of the rule set. Now, keep in mind the following regarding firewall rules, right? Rules can be inbound, outbound, or both. Rules can include services which specify the type of traffic or port numbers. Rules can be set to allow or deny. Rules can be wildcarded. And rules can be set based on uh, priority. Firewall configurations usually start by blocking all traffic by default and then allowing only specific traffic in and out over time. However, a firewall may become quite porous despite efforts to have limited access. Correctly, a configuring a firewall can keep the firewall functioning well. A layerful firewall rule allows you to control the following components, right? First is permission, traffic protocol, source IP address, destination IP address, and destination port. You can be very specific with the rules, which makes mitigating incidents with firewall configuration changes effective. For example, an, consider malware in an environment that is communicating outbound, right, on port 80. So a specific command and control server. On the other hand, a simple firewall rule change to block outbound port 80 would be effective, but it would also block all web traffic. Right? That's bad. A rule could be implemented, for example, to block port 80 traffic or even all traffic to the particular IP address of the command and control server or to a range of IP addresses. So remember that firewalls also play an important role in segmentation, right? Such as isolating the protected network from public network through a DMZ. Depending on the incident, Further configuration changes may be needed to limit access into or out of the DMZ or to deploy additional segmentation capabilities. A virtual local layer network or simply a VLAN can also be created to limit access and reduce the attack surface. A VLAN logically unites network nodes into the same broadcast domain regardless of their physical attachment to the network. VLANs provide logical separation of a physical network. Let's talk about application control. So recall the difference between allow list and block lists. Application allow lists don't attempt to block unwanted application and servers as application block denied list do. Applications allowed or approved list permit only known good applications. Allowing only specific programs to be executed, any program that is not specifically approved is blocked. In application allow list, okay, an organization approves software applications that are permitted to be used on assets. Only those approved applications can be run. The primary purpose of allow list is to protect resources from harmful applications. So for example, in Microsoft environments, right, we have what we call as app locker, which can be used to allow applications based on the following three conditions, which are the publisher for digitally signed files, the path which identifies an application by its location, and the file hash which uses a system computed cryptographic hash. So app locker rules merely allow or prevent an application from launching. They have no control over how the application behaves after it is launched. Application allows list explicitly defines the applications allowed to be run and is useful in preventing users and attackers from executing authorized application or an authorized application. As with many other control technologies, false positives can result 
when applications are updated or new applications are installed. Application allow list information that needs to stay updated. The administrative and maintenance overhead associated with complex solution is therefore higher as is the overhead when an allow list is automated. So when a security is a concern, right? <clears throat> application allow lists are a better option than block deny lists because it allows an organization to maintain strict control over the apps employees are approved to use. Block list deny lists are generally done to reduce security related events, particularly where bad actors are known. During an incident, the otherwise allowable destination or application can be denied. Maybe many mobile device management or MDM systems employ the use of allow or deny list. If an MDM system prohibits the use of a certain application, the end user will not be able to use it. This could be an effective approach, for example, if a previously allowed application now presents an attack vector. Other configuration changes that may be required include application segmentation and containerization. These methods are often used in conjunction with mobile management as a way to apply policies to mobile devices. They provide an authenticated encrypted area of the mobile device that can be used to separate sensitive corporate information from the other, you know, from the user's personal uh, use of the device. Now, additional benefits of content containerization are, are capabilities that to do the following, right? It is used to isolate apps, control app functions, delete container information, and remotely wipe the device. Let's talk about SOAR. SOAR, or Secure Orchestration, Automation and Response, is a technology stack consisting of orchestration and automation along with the threat intelligence and incident response. Essentially, the platform ingests data from various sources and then applies workflows that can be integrated across multiple systems into specific actions. Orchestration is the process of ingesting and combining the different sources of data and coordinating the workflows. Many workflows still require manual steps, but many other steps can be automated. This automation allows systems to take specific actions without human interaction. SOAR systems combine data, people, technology, and processes to do the following. First is prioritize and manage security operations activities. Formalize incident response steps for consistency to ensure that best practices are allowed and automate responses for quick containment. SOAR systems can support a number of different use cases. As related to incident mitigation, SOAR systems can use incident-related data to map operational playbooks into a digital format to automate workflows in response. Now, the idea of automating playbooks is to provide efficient and consistent response to incidents. A playbook, right? Let me put it here. Playbook. Provides manual orchestration of incident response. For example, specific incidents and threats have their own playbooks. As a result, the response that an organization takes is formalized in a step-by-step -step procedure. The incident response plans provide general governance over incident response, where areas playbooks provide more meaningful steps for specific incident types. An incident response playbook provides a specific guidance based on the incident and is similar to runbook used by IT operations for reference for routine procedures that administrators perform. A S an SOAR platform is valuable for incident mitigation because it helps in automating data gathering and response. Specific technical response techniques can be automated for the most severe vulnerabilities and threats, such as automatically patching systems or making firewall rule configuration changes. All right, so an SOAR system can assist with orchestration, right, and automation in a number of ways, which includes the following. Updating and revoking certificates. So here, queries from a certificate management system can identify expiring certificates. This data can then be mapped to user information in a directory system. Then an email is automatically sent to the user to take the proper actions. Finally, the SOAR system can later check to ensure that proper action was taken and if not, continue escalation automatically. Next is dealing with malicious network traffic. Okay, so aggregated threat alerts enriched with additional data can then 
take automated actions. This could include, for example, closing specific ports on specific host-based firewalls only. It can also include IP address or domain blocking at the network-based firewall or updating of content and URL filters. Third is preventing data loss. So based on specific DLP alerts, SOAR can help automate notifications and combine an alert with additional data to understand the threat. This can include, for example, isolating the host and blocking the data path or informing the cloud application security solution to remove a shared link to a sensitive file. All right, that's the end of the lesson. In this lesson, we talk about containment and eradication, quarantining, configuration changes, application control, and SOAR. Thank you very much for watching the video.